Welcome to another Critique the Community. Today we're going to be critiquing images of personal projects. I'm excited to see these. I just took a sneak peek. They look good. In the next critique, we're going to be doing artificial intelligence art. Not even photography. Not photography, but, it, but every photographer on planet Earth is currently using this software yeah. right now. So if you guys haven't heard of it, it's like mid-journey. It's taking over your Facebook and Instagram feeds. And I've used it. I, I ran out very quickly of my 25 attempts or whatever. Okay. And uh, I was just blown away with what this software does. Basically, mid-journey, that's the only one I've used. Um, you can sign up for it. You get invited to this Discord channel. It's like this chat on your phone. You type in a command like imagine colon or imagine backslash, and then you just put in keywords. And this computer will use your keywords and generate four images that may or may not be good. But then from that point, you can kind of direct it and massage it and tell it to go in this yeah, direction. Yeah, but I mean, just the, the images that I was coming up with were insane. They were so good. And then other people like uh, Pratik Nayak that we know, um, he's been posting stuff on Facebook daily, and I'm just blown away by it. It's so freaking good. Yeah. I was never able to get that good of results. Right. <laughs> Definitely take some tweaking. Um, I just paid for the subscription, so for the next like month, I'm no. spending thirty dollars a month. You got to give me that uh, login and password. Yeah, yeah, I could give it to you, but um, I'm about to do a podcast with Pi Jerza, who which who's doing a podcast today or tomorrow with Pratik. And I feel like the two of them, and it sounds like you, are very optimistic and excited about this. I mean, I have my issues as well. I'm excited too. I mean, I'm using it and I think it's really interesting, but there's just so many arguments coming out of it that I find really interesting. And some of them are leading to really strange things like copyright and uh, are people now artists because they put in some keywords, you know? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of interesting things. I was thinking maybe, and it sounds like maybe you're already doing this with Pi, but I was thinking about we could do a video and kind of talk about this as well because I think it is one step further away from true creativity and true artistry. Um, but I could talk about it all day. Maybe maybe we'll have to save that for another video. Well, I mean, we have a critique of the community coming up, so we're about to look at we'll your guys' images. I mean, are they images? Is this... What is this? It's they not, are images. They're not photos. Yeah, they're they not are photos. Images. But like, if it's a painting, it's still an image, right? Yeah. I just I don't think I when I see a painting on the wall, I guess that is an image. I don't know what I'm saying. You're dumb. Okay. Um, are we ready for the first image? We are. I thought I would kick this off by showing a personal project that I have not touched in like three years. But oh yeah, this is kind of uh, the beginning of how I came up with this critique. Why don't you zoom in and kind of. And so this one, if I can get your laptop open here. This is my project of, uh, I don't have a name for it yet, but it's kind of like amp builders, guitar amp builders. Mm -hmm. And so I just said, I'm going to fly out to California, stay with Mike Kelly. And LA has so many guitar manufacturers and builders and culture out there. I'm going to just email all these guys and see if they'll let me come to their little warehouse and take a portrait of them in their studio, you know, working. And so... Uh, you know, I have guys like Dave Freeman, and if you play guitar, you know Freeman amps. And then uh, this is John Thompson, who's the guy who wound up buying Bodcat amplifiers. Just a bunch of different guys, and they all have like a different style. Um, this guy here is uh, Mark Sampson. He's kind of like the godfather of amp boutique builders. He built matchless amps. But look at this, like, look at his garage. Yeah, it's crazy. His it's whole house was like this. I was like, can I use your restroom? And I go into like a half bath. And the sink is full of just parts and like cry it like it's like the back to the future. He's like a hoarder, but <laughs> he knew where everything was. And I mean, this guy, he's designing stuff. Like he couldn't tell me a lot of the things he was working with, but I think he had his hand in like, I don't know if it was Bose, but he was working with a headphone company and he's one of those guys where his ears are so good hmm. that, you know, audio companies are paying him to do consulting. Because I don't think he really builds amps anymore. But anyway, I started this project, and you know, there's probably 20 people I would love to photograph. Some of them have already died. Some of them aren't making amps anymore at all. But I started this project, and I think I shot. I have six here. I think I shot like eight or ten people. And uh, from LA, I flew to Chicago to shoot one other guy up there. He's the guy in the top left. 
And so I've done a few of them. What's your end goal with this? Because I feel like it's, I'm sure you're such a big guitar fan that just getting to meet these guys is probably kind of a, a win in itself. Yeah, it was pretty interesting to hear their stories. I should have like recorded it because mm. they were telling all these interesting stories that I've already forgotten. Mm. Um, but yeah, I just enjoyed the experience of being able to say like, I have a matchless amp, I know who designed it, and then I now know who runs the company, mm. and to go see, I mean, some of these people were in a room this size, and it's like they're producing these amplifiers for the biggest artists in the world. You go see John Mayer or whoever, and there's the amps there. And you're like, this came out of this room. It's just super cool and interesting to me. And so, but what's the end goal? I don't know. Like, I thought originally I would just like to get these published in like a guitar magazine and put that in, you know, oh, okay. my yeah. byline or something. But then I started thinking about it and I was like, it could be so much bigger than that. If I teamed up with like a writer, maybe we could make a coffee table book. Or, you know, I was shooting those guitar pedals. I think we did a few of those on the YouTube channel. Like, maybe pair that up with the amps, and you could have some kind of encyclopedia. But that would take a ton that of work. That would be a lot of work. So, I don't know. I thought, could I team up with a pe pedal builder? or some, some of these guys run, like, shows just on pedals. And just go up there for, like, a month or a, a couple weeks and just build a system. And, like, we're going to shoot 2,000 pedals and just knock it out, send it off to retouchers to just clean them up and make them look good. And then they would write the paragraph about that pedal. Maybe this has already been done, but and this would require insane access, but you know, you'd get to meet all your idols. Is there any interest in a coffee table photo style book of photos of professional uh, musicians pedal boards where it's it's like their pedals and the layout that they like. Yeah, yeah. And so it'd be like their setup and then a little bio about them. That's potentially a better idea than even the amp builders, you know? Like, I like the amp builders because each one of their locations is going to be so crazy, right? I mean, some of these guys have warehouses, like this guy here, the Bad Cat Company. It's a huge warehouse where, uh, you know, Matchless was tiny, you know? But yeah, the, the whole idea behind this, and what makes this exciting for me, is that you reach out to one guy, and you take his portrait, and then you use that as leverage to get the next guy. And I don't know that I went for a hierarchy. I just kind of reached out to one at a time. But once I said, hey, I'm doing this, this, and this, and I'm in your area, it opened the doors to where now I have this portfolio of amp builders that any musician at that level would know. They probably yeah. met these guys. Yeah, you're right. And they're like, awesome, you know, you know Mark, like, I love his stuff. Yeah. Let's do something. Yeah, and so yeah. it's this idea of leveraging in portraiture. Now, if you did something with landscapes or maybe what we're about to see, it could be totally different. If you take some series of lighting, it doesn't necessarily open the door like getting access to people would. Right. So, yeah, I love the idea of doing some kind of coffee table book, and it's probably way bigger than amp builders. Maybe it's pedals or maybe it's like pedal boards of the stars. Um, so I don't know. This is the kind of stuff that gets me excited, but I think – the biggest advice that I have for people watching this is that you just have to do it. Yes. And in some sense, I have done it. I've taken eight. But I'm nowhere near where I want to be. I haven't touched this in years. I haven't published this the first time I've even, I'm even showing these images. So it's like you got to do it, but then you have to have the goal of following through and completing it. Yeah. And I think that is by far the hardest part. Taking a picture is not that really that hard. You know, I, I filled a bag with one or two lights, an umbrella made a bunch of phone calls and emails, I got the access, I did the photos. That was kind of the easy part. The next part is to figure out how to monetize it, how to publish it, how to make it a collective piece. Well, it's also the, the discipline to continue when you're kind of bored of it. Yeah. And you're like, damn it, I've already traveled all over the place. I've already met my idols. Now I'm looking at like cheaper speakers that I don't really care about as much. You know, yeah, yeah. I'm not that excited about doing, but I have to because I have to finish this, and that was the goal from the very beginning. Um, and uh, something like this, you know, um, like I said, some of these people are passing away, like Jim, Mar you know, Marshall Amps. Like, you can't shoot him anymore. Like, he's gone. Like, you, you won't have access to that stuff. And did I had you this, shoot him? No, oh. like, I mean, he died, you know, decades ago. So, yeah, of course. Um when I was shooting this, I was also like, I would love to take a portrait of uh, Little Richard. He's just such an icon of early rock and roll music. Hmm. And then a couple years ago, I remember him passing away and being like, damn it. Like, he was in Tennessee 
not that far from where I lived. He probably could be accessible because he's not the rock star that he was, you know, previously. Yeah. And you just get to these points where, like, I keep thinking of all the classic musicians. I mean, we just had a Rolling Stone die. You know, soon we're going to have Keith. Who? Charlie Watts, the drummer. He's, uh, like, I didn't know. done. And you're going to start seeing these this generation of, like, some of the most iconic musicians that, in my opinion, will never be surpassed because they laid the groundwork for what everything was. They're going to start passing mm. away. And if you can't get photos of them and you can't capture them and, like, have those experiences for yourself, it's going to, you know, that window is going to close and it's going to be over with. But I don't want this whole video to be about shooting people or my project or whatever, but I just wanted to share kind of what led me to think that this would be a good critique. The next image is going to be the highest rated image okay. um, in this. And just to warn people and you, not all of these have multiple images. Some of them are just one image that is or would be a series. So it's kind of a mix matched uh, set of images here. But Here's the highest rated. This is so project. good. I, I I saw this right before we went live, and I love this. I think it's so cool. Can you zoom in and go to each? Yeah, end? yeah. Do you? I mean, you know what the theme is. You. I just your... assume this is Santa in the off season, right? Yeah, yeah. So here he is, like a skater, or you know, running a skate shop, or you know, you don't really know exactly the details. But, yeah. Um, and then here he is, just you know, reading. <laughs> Stories, bedtime stories for kids or something. <laughs> and then uh, Ugh, running a street it's business. It's so good. It's like this model is so good because you, like, you wouldn't think that you could get a fit-looking person that would actually play as Santa. But then this photographer has done an amazing job of the styling of this these photos as well. Yeah. I mean... Finding this guy, first of all, is huge, but then finding red leather pants and the white furry jacket, I mean, it just it is It shows perfect. that he definitely put money and time into this, you know? Yeah. He, like, thought it through. He got a stylist, or he styled it himself, you know? And a lot of the stuff isn't, like, super cheap looking, even if it is cheap. If he went on Amazon and bought some of this stuff, he styled it in a way where, I mean, look at that jacket. That doesn't look like... I mean, I don't want to say it's not a cheap jacket. You get these ads on Facebook for, like, these badass-looking jackets. Sure. I've ordered some of them. They never fit. <laughs> like they're, they're made from China, and they're, like, falling apart, but they look cool. This isn't just something he pulled out of his, you know, wardrobe or found at the thrift store, I don't think. So this was taken by Angela Perez. Is that a woman, I think? I want to say that Angela Perez might have won... The last critique, she was the girl who did the, she did the black uh, Ann Leibovitz Vanity Fair type oh, of yeah, images. Oh yeah, I'm looking at them right here. Okay. Um, so she was in the critique that was cliche images, and I think you were even like, I think this looks great. This isn't a cliche <laughs> image, <laughs> right. but um, it was cliche in the sense of like the styling and everything. She doesn't give much detail about. You know, she just said she wanted to do something new and fresh for Christmas. She calls this not your average Santa. Um, we like to call our updated version Zaddy Claus. Um, so I, I would love to know how you found this person, how you got these clothes. Uh, I, I just, I love it. I think it's great. All right, maybe we and, should and these, it. Well, And these are the type of images that I think would grab attention from a lar larger audience, you know? And some blog is going to write about this, or this is the sort of thing that gets you on the Today Show. And they're like, look what this photographer mm -hmm, had mm -hmm, fun doing, you know, mm -hmm. right before the holiday season she did the series. Oh. Those sort of things are really interesting to me and, and can give you a lot of leverage because that's kind of what personal projects are all about, is not only expanding what you can do as a creative person, but also now opening a door for something bigger or, you know, access to something and you always talk about, oh, I'd love to see this image as a series with multiple images that are somewhat similar or cohesive. And I feel like this is such an amazing example of how each one of these images is great. There's no doubt. But when you put them together, yeah. I mean, we're, we're about to see. Look at we're the middle, look at the middle image. This. If you just saw that on your own, you'd be like, I, I would, don't even know that looks like Santa, you know? No, nah, yeah, I would not think that's Santa at all. I might not think that any of these were Santa on their own. Yeah. But together, with the red throughout, I'm like, that's Santa. Yeah. Three, two, one. I'm going to go five. I'm going five, baby. It's been a long time since we've gone uh, world-class image. but uh, Everything's I, done so well. Like, the lighting 
is professional but not like over the top. Mm -hmm. The toning is great, the composition's great, the styling's great. Like this is kind of this is definitely what I would love to see in every one of our critiques. Like this is the standard by which we hope to see, you know, five star images. Because this is the bar. Like this is what I think a lot of photographers should be comparing the work that they put out to is something like this, you know. Well, let's move on. All right. The next image is actually three separate images. They were all submitted individually, but because this is uh, personal projects and series, I thought it would be good to show all of them side by side. Okay, let's go. I don't know if you here. have you read anything about this. Do you? No. Okay, so here's the first image. I can see if you can figure out what the the project is. Okay. So there's image one. Here's image two. This actually is kind of similar to what I did. It's like the guy in his workshop. Yep. And then image three. All the same photographer, all part of the same series. Let me see the first one again. Huh. Yeah, I'm having a hard time figuring out what each one has in common. I believe these are all just craftsmen in their... Oh, oh, okay. So they're not... It's not the same type of no, like, craftsman. That makes sense. Can you tell what this guy is? Is that like countertops or... <laughs> countertops? I have a countertop wouldn't be that thin, though, would it? No. Like glass or uh, art? Or, is there know. any chance that he's he's making uh, the glass lamp that's oh, behind Oh, yeah, him? yeah. That would make sense. Like stained glass, maybe. Or... And then this one's got to be clocks, but... Or watches? Yeah, I think I think I read this one's a watch, but I do kind of wish you could see the watch better. So this was taken by Philip Kowalski. Absolutely. This is a watchmaker working in his oldest watch works in... Working in the oldest watch works in my city. Part of my ongoing personal project of craftsmen. It took me about a year to convince him to participate in my project. I feel grateful he agreed. So cool, man. Like, this image is incredible. I just love everything about this. The weird composition yeah. works so well. I love the light on the background. I love the color. My only critique is that that second image, I wish the tone of the second image matched the first and the third. This one? See how much cooler this one feels than the other two? Yeah. Uh, it's a great photo as well. It's great. But, you know, if this is going to be in a book or published in some story or something, I, I want it to be just a little warmer. Even if it's just him or the background or something, I just need that warmth. Maybe. I mean, I definitely face this issue with my series, and I feel like if you put any three of my amp builders side by side, there's definitely some tone and color differences. But once I put six or seven or eight of them together and they all start to deviate a little mm, bit, it mm. bothers me a little less. I see what you're saying. That makes sense. Um, but these are like late afternoon and then late afternoon, it's got that same sort of lighting vibe. Yeah. Obviously, this one looks the most different because of the separation and the closeness to the camera, where you know these guys are further away. Whew, man, they're just so good from an editorial standpoint. You know, like they tell. I always talk about telling a story. Yeah, I don't know what story they're telling, but yeah. I mean, they're just like they're, they're in their spot. They're in their spot. They're working. They're not posing for the camera. Like maybe this guy looks like he's posing a little bit more. Off camera, we were talking about uh, Hugh Hefner earlier. This guy kind of has like a Hugh Hefner vibe. Hmm. What is this guy making? The last guy? Yeah. Oh, let me see. He said, is a stonemason. I don't know what a stonemason does. All right, are you ready to rate it? Yeah. Three, two, one. Between a three and a four. Really? I, I feel like the first and the third image, I want to give five stars to. Maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe four is more accurate. Definitely more accurate. These are. I do good. think the, 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 this one's a little weaker, but... 
I think the problem that I have with this is with just three images at the moment and just not having a title, it doesn't hit you as strongly as the Santa. When mm. you see Santa in the off season, mm. what a great idea. And this one, it's guys in their workspace, which is exactly what I did too. So I'm not saying like, you know, it's better or worse than the idea that I did myself, but it doesn't, it's not quite as nuanced. Mm. I wish this guy, I, I wish like you could see the watch in his hand a little bit better. Or he had just a few other pocket watches or something on the table in front of him just to give you that slight little bit of context. Because without that, this image on its own is what? It could be like a Better Call Saul type of character, you know? It's, <laughs> I it's don't like, know. I feel like you got the clocks on the wall in the background. I feel like this might be easier to pick out than the other two. It's be- it is a beautiful image. I love the long shadows, and I wonder if that was done... I Naturally, bet, I or bet he did that. Who was strobed? Yeah. All right. Next up. All right. Next image is three and one. So we'll have to zoom into these quite a bit. All right. Show me what we're working with here. Oh, I've, we've seen these before. We have. Yeah. And another critique. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? Why do I not recall these? You don't remember that one? No. Is my memory getting that bad? Yeah, you're an old What was man. the theme? Shot during no COVID idea. or something? Or like portraits of men or I don't know. Or quirky. Okay. I love the tones in this. And I love the architecture. I mean, just having something as simple as a parking lot, but it reminds me of Pi Jerza space where like, Everything is brand new and clean, and the lines have perfectly been drawn out. Like, trying to find this in most towns would be kind of difficult. To find a place where everything is so pristine. This was taken by Michael Rocktashell. These pictures were part of my COVID Summer Vibes series, shot in on, shot in on one of the lockdowns. Shot in on on of the lockdowns. Good God. I can't read and I can't read everybody's horrible writing. Things we took for granted like going on vacation were impossible to think of. So how would a summer vacation look like in a COVID lockdown? I love that. I mean, I feel like during COVID, in a way, I'm very glad we have did the COVID journals. In another way, I'm very upset we did the COVID journals, and I wish we had just (laughs) worked on something else. Yeah. But um, I think they will be a good historical reference one day, even if it's just for me. But uh, it's cool. Share with your kids and be like. Maybe so. We'll see. I don't know. It might be inappropriate. We were just recently in that house, like, playing poker. Yeah. And I just looked over, and I was like, for, like, 90 days straight, I sat right over there and talked about COVID Every day. And then got COVID. And, like, all the things that happened, I waxed my hair, you know? Yeah. And then here we are playing poker with all these crazy people, and it's it's just kind of a trip to be in that, that house still. Absolutely. All right, you ready to rate this? I am. Three, two, one. I think I'm a four as well. Four stars. I like this a lot. I don't think I like this as much as the Craftsman series in the last one, but I gave them both four, four stars. I think it's really good. Um, I love the uh, the tonality um, consistency in this. Yeah, like it's the color grade. This purple and yeah. warmth color, and I love that all of these are shot with a different composition, but they all have the same vibe and feel. You know, it feels like this is all taken on one. And for anybody interested, he says this was taken on a newly made parking lot, which looked almost like a render. That's super cool. You know, yeah. you I was trying to figure out what in the world is this? How does it look so perfect? And it's a unused parking lot. Interesting. The thing when I see images like this is you're like, man, if only I knew where a parking lot was that I could shoot on. I look at this and think like, how easy would it be to clone out all the bad paint and then just draw in? It's certainly possible. I don't know that I'd be good at it, but somebody would be. Yeah. This is also like, do you think this project is worth pursuing? Like, can we're past the pandemic to some degree? I mean, like nobody's acting like the pandemic's around, even though I see an article every now and then. Monkeypox could be coming. Monkeypox. Is this something you would continue to make more images for today to make this more complete? I f- or is the novelty <laughs> of the lockdown kind of worn off to where? This- I feel like yeah, you, that was a one or two year ago type thing. It was awesome. Follow the trend. I mean, we know Monty Isom made a ton of money going around New York City taking snapshots of like 
gloves and masks on the ground or in the gutter or in a trash can and then people would be up in their windows like clapping for the hospital workers and he'd take snapshots. These are not good photos. And then he would sell them for thousands of dollars to news agencies around the world. Because you remember there was a period where every commercial was just like, we can get through this together and it was all stock imagery and no one was working. Yeah. Yeah. So you just got to predict the next pandemic or the next like big war and start like prepping your images. Start taking recession photos today. <laughs> All right. Ready for the next one? Yeah. Do you have any? What is this? So this one only has the one image. And I believe in reading this, this image took like 30 hours to make something crazy. This Come was on. taken by Stephen DeVette. Um, this image of the Tulip Nebula took weeks of work to make with several nights of collecting exposures with different kinds of filters and specialized equipment to get all of the different colors of the nebula. Slightly above and to the right of the Tulip Nebula, you can see an arc created by the effect, the effects, a black hole, Cygnus X1 is having on a nearby star. What in the world? A black hole believed to be about 21 times the mass of the sun, but only about 50 to 300 kilometers wide. Goodness. Total exposure, 37.5 hours. Oh, my gosh. That would be a project that would take a long time to complete. (sighs) If every time you did it, you had to commit over a day. You know what's too bad about certain genres of photography like this is that without reading that, nobody would find this impressive, you know? Because it's like we've all seen photos of space and it's like maybe it's computer generated, maybe not, whatever. We don't understand it. We'll never do it ourselves. So we just kind of jump over it until you read what it actually takes to capture something like this. It's unbelievable. Minimize this. This is an interesting conversation that I have with the AI art stuff. Is because AI could create something like this that's maybe even more interesting to look at so easily. But you like, do you put value on something being real or being created with a purpose? Like, if you had, I do. like, yes. you never will think of this nebula and black hole, right? And it's so far out there, like in a lot of ways, like aren't a lot of the NASA images, they're, they're colorized to make it look like what they should look like. When you see the raw files that come off of some of this stuff, like this might be, I don't know if this is a single 36 exposure, hour exposure, or like they're taking all these images and building something. It's super so. complex and you have to interpret it in a very different way than we do just with a single raw file, right? Right. But with AI art, you could say, imagine this thing, and it produces something like way more, I don't know if it's way more interesting, because this has a lot of detail in it, but you know what I'm saying. It looks more like fantasy and more artsy, and maybe you could sit there and look at it longer and find more interesting things than even this, which has a lot of interesting stuff going on. But I would I would imagine that you're right. This is worth more, this has more value, right? Because it's real. And it's intentional. I would hope so. Sure. But not necessarily. Like, if you saw these side by side and you didn't know the story, yeah. could you have thought that this is – imagine five years in the future. You would just assume that's AI art and I prefer this other image better and this image is made in 30 seconds. That's the problem with this AI art. It's, it's too good now. Um, but do you think we will revert back – this is a conversation I want to have with Pi. Like, today – more albums are sold in vinyl format. This super analog old thing is now what people desire the most if they're going to purchase music. Okay. There's a trend of like that. I don't know it's the same with photography, but a lot of people buy film to shoot weddings on. And we have this desire to go back in time and hold on to something that is more real and physical. Uh, maybe you could find other arguments. I, I was having this argument with uh, our discussion with our friend Charlie. When all cars are self-driving and they all are battery, the desire to have an old muscle car will be greater than ever, right? It might be super hard to drive it and get insurance and the government might not let you drive it because you're a threat to society. But at some point, like everything becomes such a novelty that the older version of it, if it was good, 
could be in higher demand or valued more. Your dad's car, sure. like, like, would that ever be worth more in the same condition that it's in than the newest Tesla car when everybody owns the same Tesla yeah, car? I think it'll definitely be worth more. I mean, I think it's appreciating in value every day as it becomes more and more rare and the other variations that are out there are slowly wrecking and being sent to landfills. What's weird with the AI art, though, is that every one of those is like an NFT. You know, it's like its own unique, unique thing. thing. So I know. you could make the argument that that is the most rare piece of art because only one of them ever exists. Agreed. I don't know how all this is going to play out. Let's rate it. I have no idea how to rate this. Three, two, one. I don't know. I, I what did honestly, you rate it? Uh, maybe four. Like, I just don't know that I would see this image without the story and give it a second thought. But with the story and the explanation, I feel like I'm super impressed. But the, at the same time, I don't know if this is a good example of this subject. Yeah, I've so never seen anything like it. Astro Steve is here in the comments. This is a type of uh, astrophotography that I know nothing, I know very little about. You know, I know they have these follow machines yeah. that allow you to focus and you're stacking and it seems incredibly complex. We did a tutorial with Alaya and I think part of the end of the tutorial was intro to star photography or something. And it was basically just long exposures to get like landscape shots with stars. And I remember people saying like, when will you teach this? And going down this rabbit hole, it's it's a whole other field that I know nothing about. Absolutely. So I see what you're saying. Is this a good example of this, or is this super common? So this is Astro Steve is in the chat right now, and he says he doesn't even rate it a four because NASA makes their photos public domain, and it's impossible to beat NASA. And that was going to be something that I brought up is that if you are competing with like super telescopes that governments around the world own, how can you ever compete with that? Well, can't you say the same about other forms of photography? No, if, because if I feel like- If you're shooting an old 35 millimeter film, how could you ever compete with a 100 megapixel camera? Yet, I would think some of the most expensive photographs ever to sell were not created with but from a technical standpoint of like the most detail oh, sure. in the nebula. Sure. Well, it's the same with film and digital. I mean, I don't think film has the most detail. Sure. But it just seems like with this genre of photography, the goal is clarity and detail. This isn't an artistic image. This is like a scientific, you know, you're trying to show what this thing looks like. But from a branding standpoint, would you ever buy a print from NASA and hang it on your wall and it have the same feeling as, oh, there's a guy who takes pictures that aren't as good, Maybe. but this guy I has become know. the guy. It's I the Peter Lick I, argument. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, Peter yeah. Lick's not the best landscape photographer, but if you ask people who have his work around here, they're like, he's the greatest photographer ever. And it's this branding thing where, I don't know, I've seen some of this stuff and it looks like it was shot on a potato. It's like, this took me 36 hours to make and I stacked 1,200 images together and I got this. And then you look at it and you're like, I mean, it looks, it doesn't look good. All right. And maybe it's zoomed in so much or it doesn't have the resolution. I don't know this genre very well, but I've definitely seen astrophotography like this where the final output is not something that I even And really, this one does look good. This one looks super sharp and clear. All right, next up. Oh, I've seen this one before. So this image I almost didn't include because I don't know if Brian is doing a series on guitars burning, but this was you a- didn't, You didn't say you wanted a series. You said you wanted a personal project. But I know, I don't know, I've never talked to Brian specifically about this, but I know the personal project is definitely the building and designing of this guitar. He wanted to build his dream guitar. And then once it was built, he then did what he always does and takes an amazing product shot of that so, guitar. For those who don't know who we're talking about, this is a photograph by Brian Rogers Jr. He's an amazing uh, product photographer. Um, his portfolio probably has the most five-star reviews of any portfolio I've ever seen. And we did a tutorial with him a few years ago called The Hero Shot. It's currently in our store, fstoppers.com slash store. Um, check it out. You can also, if you Google him on 
uh, YouTube or you know search his name on YouTube you can see uh, a tutorial that we did with him a long time ago on shooting a bottle and it's got over a million views now um, so his work is amazing we should team up and burn all the guitar amps in front of the builders there you themselves go. are you ready to rate it I'm ready to rate it Three, two, one. I feel like this is a five star. Four, five. Four or five. I'm in between a four and a five. Um, you know, again, I feel like you do this in a series. It elevates it. It makes it feel even more professional. You can you can sense the amount of work and effort that went into it when it's in a series. Next up. Well, I'm just thinking like this is another thing where you could get some kind of access to like. A famous guitar player is never going to burn his best guitar, but maybe they would let you photograph their guitar and composite the flames into it. Or maybe you turn this into a real series where you're actually lighting guitars on fire, and it's kind of like the hard rock where you go in there and it's like some cheap guitar that you know was owned by mm. Ace Frehley or Eddie Van Halen or something, but you're like, oh, that's one of their guitars, but that's the $400 one. Mm. I just saw this video of a guitar player from... Uh, Pearl Jam and he's just smashing a guitar and he like destroys everything and everyone in this group is like why would he break something that's worth so much money and they're all debating whether or not the guitar was like a cheap guitar that is mm. just for show and everything but anyway if you could do enough of these and then suddenly you approach a few guitar players that are well known enough all of a sudden now you're you're lighting John Mayer's guitar on fire or one that he puts into the series you know that could be kind of yeah. cool yeah and I mean as and then you're the only guy who's got the guitars on fire series, <laughs> like. Well, and I feel like it doesn't have to destroy the guitar. If you did it with the right type of alcohol or something, it might add some scorch marks, but the guitars could still survive. It'd just be hard to do that with one of their prize guitars, but like yeah. John Mayer has his own series of guitars through yeah. uh, Paul Reed Smith. He could easily get a production model, and they would just do it for the publicity. That would be sure. the kind of thing you do, where it's like. That's his guitar. It's on fire. I don't know. Pretty cool idea. Next up. This is another image that only has one to show, but... You didn't ask for a series, Patrick. It's a personal project. Yeah. That doesn't mean series. I think I've seen this image, too. This was taken by T Timu Andreas. Um, this is a personal project. I wish to continue this summer slash fall. I was inspired by the movie The Witch and I wanted to create a concept where a young couple is struggling with their fate after unfortunate, unfortunate events. Have you seen The Witch? Do you know what he's talking about? I don't think so. I wonder if it's good. The Witch. Yeah, I don't think I've seen it. Is it new? I, I mean, I don't know. I okay. want to say I saw it on one of the streaming platforms recently, but I'm bad with just going through so many videos and never finding something I want. I, I, every night, Katie's like, find something that we can watch together. And I try. And most nights, I'm like, I just can't find anything. And I just go to bed. <laughs> and every once in a while, I'm like, let's try this. And it's horrible. And I, I, I don't know if I'm just like an old asshole now, and nothing's good enough for me. I, I don't feel like I'm this like this with any other aspect of my life, though. It's just television shows and movies. I just yeah. almost hate all of them. I do not find them entertaining. I watch a lot of true crime because even if it's not done real well, the story behind it's real. And yeah, I'm like, I like this documentaries. Is crazy. I just watched one on the. Uh, uh, what is the guy's name? Ramirez, the, the night stalker in California, and how crazy it is that he killed like dozens of people and no one could figure out who he was and like how they find out who it is. And Yeah, I can get down with that. And then that led me to watch a movie called Night Stalker, which is kind of old. It's like 10 or 15 years old. Have you ever seen this movie where this guy... Sounds familiar. It's Jake Gyllenhaal. Is that how you say his last name? Yeah. He becomes, um, he's this like neurotic character, and he becomes one of those guys in LA that runs around with the camera and oh, starts yeah. filming the crime. And then he starts getting deeper into it where he's like getting their face all bleeding as they're <laughs> dying. And this news agency keeps running it because it's like, you have the craziest footage. And uh, it had a pretty strange plot twist. I don't know that I would give it like a A plus or anything, but maybe on Rotten Tomatoes it was an 80 or 85%. Hmm. I thought I remember watching that years ago and 
not liking it, but maybe, I don't know. All right, um, are you ready to rate this? Did I show people full screen? Just in case I didn't. Here it is, full screen. Are you ready? Um, yeah. Three, two, one. I'm in between a three and a four on this. I feel like it's done really well, but at the same time, there's just not that much going on. I don't find it as interesting as the Santa, you know what I mean? Or the flames on the guitar. Yeah. Photographically, it's really good. Yeah. The lighting's great. The toning is really good. And I feel like the the models and the clothing, they did really well. And the expressions are great. Like, neither one of them is really ruining. It's easy to ruin a photo where one person's doing something strange. Yeah. Um, what would the rest of this... I know it doesn't have to be a series, but if this is a personal project that you're investing time in... He did say in, he wanted it to be a series. It almost feels kind of like, you know, what they have a name for it, where you just take stills on a movie production. There's like a guy in a quiet camera mm -hmm. box, which I guess now cameras can be silent, but you just take the picture and it's like this is an outtake of that movie. I don't know if that makes it better or worse without more production value in on your own, but it does look like that. It feels like this is... Absolutely. Let's move on. What do we have here? Are and we going to just do the last image as the, the random winner since sure. we've gone down this far? All right. This image was taken by... Andreas... Wetzel. This is my first try at dance photography. I met the dancer on a video production and I got in touch with her regarding a photo shoot. We created a couple of images with different outfits, poses, backgrounds, and light sets. The jumping shot, my favorite of the series, was one I had planned for later in the day. So she was fully warmed up and blah, blah, blah. He goes through how exactly he shot it. You know one of the most successful photographers of our time is, depending on how you look at the analytics? It's the guy It's the guy in New York City who does, like, the Dancers Among Us series. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, like, people, like, striking a pose in the middle of a He gets street. these dancers, yeah, and he just gets them to do things. Like, if you go to YouTube and type in a bunch of keywords and then sort by most viewed... He shows up, like, all his videos have, like, 9, 10, 20 million views. What? It's crazy. <laughs> okay, well, good I for him. I wish I could remember the guy's name. But <laughs> a lot of what he's doing now is these TikTok things where he finds some TikTok dancer who's got billions of views, and they team up together, and they're like, we're going to do a dance thing like this underwater, and he's going to get the camera and go underwater. And it'll have, like, 20 million, like, it's the highest viewed count of any of these photos, like... Name the most successful YouTuber that you know. Peter McKinnon smokes him. And I feel like I never see his videos pop up on any feeds. Right. But he's got a ton of views. And, and he's got books and he's, you know, he's done all this other stuff to This is going to make me sound like an old man, but are people making a living on TikTok? I don't know. Cuz I think you can make money. I think it pays kind of like YouTube does, but I I thought I heard a long time ago that they paid pennies compared to YouTube. Possibly. It sounds like um, people use TikTok to send you to other things. and hmm. TikTok's a weird space. I, I've made an account, and I've thought about doing it for F-Stoppers, but every time I like really want to sit down and edit a video, the first video, I just start watching other videos, and I'm like, do I want to be a part of this community? It's, it drives me so crazy. I've been very proud of myself that I've never once downloaded the application or seen it because I know, like, I'm already addicted to YouTube. I'm already addicted to Reddit. I'm already addicted to Facebook. So I've never gotten Instagram for that reason. I just stay away from it because I know the whole game is to get me addicted to where I'm, like, looking at it without even thinking. But when it could be a business right. tool, it's tricky. Right. Pi was telling me a story. I don't know if you'll be able to figure out who this photographer is. But he was basically saying, this photographer had a TikTok, and it was okay. Like, he got a couple thousand views or whatever. But all of a sudden, he started doing this crazy... Uh, he was a wedding photographer. And so he built this platform around his business. And then he started... He made one video where he just walked around and acted like a cat. And he made it like a TikTok video where it's like... 
if humans were cats or something stupid, right? And it gets millions of views. So then he's like, I got to follow that up with another video. And he's like completely destroyed his wedding business. And now all he does are these stupid TikTok videos where he acts like different animals because it's the only thing he can do. But there's no monetization behind it. Like what brand would want to sponsor a video where you walk around and act like a giraffe? Like it's <laughs> strange. And I but might have if you're some, getting paid, if he's getting paid, then I don't go think, for it. I don't think he's making any real money, so, yeah, though, with the views. The point? It's like people trying to get paid on YouTube. It doesn't pay that well. I mean, for some people it does. It does, maybe, but you, you have to be in the right field. Yeah. But that platform's different, too. TikTok, you're just watching something for 10 seconds. And it's oh. so obnoxious. All right, we've got to get back on topic here. Are we ready to rate this? Is TikTok still a thing? TikTok's like the biggest thing. It's the biggest platform, I thought right? Trump made some deal that like either an American company buys TikTok or we're blocking it from the United States. There was something about that because it was a security threat. Yeah. And I see that starting to pop up again. I saw some headlines about that too. And I was like, well, what happened to what Trump did? So. He didn't do anything. Now Biden's going to try to do it. Three, two, one. I'm between a three and a four on this. I feel like it's it's done well. But like you said, I think we've all seen some pretty incredible dancing photos, so maybe this pushes me a little closer to a three, but I think it's it's great. The lighting's great. The feel of this big studio space is great. Her clothing is awesome. It's colorful. You, I would imagine you'd have to do multiple shots of different people doing a, a move, but it's not... I don't know that it's just quite as interesting and unique as some of the other series that we've seen. Oh, certainly. All right, next up. Let's go full uh, screen. We have one, here. I think we have one more after this. So this is kind of strange because the crop on all these looks really weird. <laughs> right? Doesn't it? It does look weird, yeah. But what this is, is uh, is it Brenheiser, the Brenheiser effect, where you take a pano using a lens that's more narrow okay. and allows you to get a shallower depth of field, okay. but done with landscapes. Okay. And I don't know Let if you can really this. see that in the first two images, but the bottom one definitely kind of has that effect where it looks like it's more shallow depth of field than what it should be for that focal length. But it's kind of an interesting idea. Yeah, I'm not really noticing it on these top two. Hmm. And maybe the top two aren't quite employing that effect, but essentially I think these are all panos. Panos a little too wide of an idea for a series, though. You're like, I'm going to go do some panos. It just seems like a common... But, I mean, obviously it's kind of similar. It's like these tree trunks by the ocean, so it's similar. The series is not Panos. The series no, is No, I don't like know. Do beach. you want to pull up and see what he says? Because I... I guess we could go straight to the source, couldn't we? Yeah. No, we have a spammer in here asking for naked HD XY. Help our friends find the perfect match. Ban. Dusty Cooper took this, and he said, I've been experimenting combining different techniques with panoramic stitching. The first image is somewhat uh, traditional, uh, but it's one of... But it's one of my early attempts to shoot a pano with a shallow depth of field. The second image is a combination of slow shutter and panoramic stitching. The third is an extreme example of using shallow depth of field and a panoramic stitching. These range from 30 to 50 single images. Good gosh. Are you ready to rate this? I think I am. Three, two, one. I'm in between a two and a three on this. Like, I'm looking at it, and I'm like, do these images, are they cohesive? Do they kind of match? Does this feel like a series, or does this feel just like three random images? The tough thing is... Last week or two weeks ago when we set this Critique the Community, I believe I said something like a personal project should require 
a conceptual idea and maybe some risk, maybe financial involvement, pre-planning. Like it's it's got a lot going on to where it feels cohesive and it feels like you're pushing and stretching your own creativity and your portfolio. This to me doesn't quite check all those boxes. I like the image below the most, but it almost feels like these were just all taken on a trip out to the flatland, you know, the low country or something, and you're at the water yeah. and you just happen to be there. I don't know if these were printed large and put on a wall that you would walk in and be like, whoa, well, this idea or like this paid off or this is so different and unique or maybe if you take portraits, it, it is because you don't have anything else like that, but it just doesn't <laughs> feel like this. So I'm going to be a little harsh here. Dusty, we love you. Don't be upset. Um, we are from Charleston, South Carolina which is like a huge vacation spot. It's very historic, lots of beautiful architecture and scenery and art and mm -hmm. photography, right? But, and, and you can walk downtown and you can go past one art gallery, past the next of paintings, and they're, you know, tens of thousands of dollars per painting. But what about the photography galleries that you pass? Have you noticed anything? In Charleston? Yes. They're horrible. Yeah, like all of them. They but look like AI one. art. <laughs> they don't know about that. But they look much worse than these photos. And I bring this up for two different reasons. One, I think they're, I think it's really bad, like snapshots of like wrought iron gates and doors and letters found in gates and, you know, like A, B, C, D, so you can spell your name. And it's like all that garbage it's also a lot of like the bridge but then taken from the worst weird crop where there's a bush and somehow that now makes it with the, with the sun and then like the, flare. the flares coming through yeah like every picture is is so weird now i'm complaining about it because i think it's really bad but maybe they're affording a storefront right how much do those buildings cost per month are they like fifty thousand a month for those storefronts Maybe they are cleaning up and we are the dummies, yeah, right? We could have made that. Maybe thing. I think this isn't very good. And and let me be clear. This I think is, what I see in those galleries is much worse than this. This is kind of in the middle. I yeah. feel like this isn't horrible, but it's also not far enough along where you say, I got to purchase that and put it on my wall necessarily. So it's the same thing. Like we have this, um, the Market Street in Charleston where all these people have the booths, you know, and they're making little trinkets or candles or whatever. Or selling them from India. Yeah. And there's always the photography ones, and they're all so bad. It's like HDR landscapes at the beach, and it'll be like hundreds of them all in mats, and you can flip through them. And I'm always like, how are they selling these? Yeah. But maybe they are. Maybe they are cleaning up, and we... Are fools. The question is obviously, could you do the same business model with great photography and compete with that? I would imagine great photography, you would want to raise the rates a whole lot, right? But nobody's going to go to the market and spend $1,000 on a print, but they'll spend $25, $60. Like, that's <laughs> the limit. Maybe. I don't know. You would just think if there are other art galleries on every corner where the cheapest painting is five grand. How can every photo gallery have the cheapest be $15? It just doesn't add up to me. Well, not to bring this back to AI art, but I will. It makes me wonder, like, what? how do people appreciate art? Because if you are willing to spend $40 on what we would say is horrible photography of Charleston and put it on your wall, some people, it's just disposable art. I just need something there so it's colorful. At what point is AI art the perfect medium for that? Could I you just agree. go in and be like, let me make some crazy thing, spend like a couple minutes, and then if we can get it to high, uh, up, up res high enough, I don't know that they're giving you really high res files yet, but could you print a poster of something that costs nothing and it looks crazy interesting, I'm gonna put it on my wall, and that's even for somebody who might actually value art. But when I see people buy this stuff that looks horrible. 
but I think many of them, they're like, wow, look at the pink and the magenta and the orange in the sky. It's so vibrant, even though they just moved the vibrant slider to a million. Yeah. Wow, look at the, like, I don't know. I think it's so bad, but maybe that's just because I'm a photographer. Because the other thing with the AI, AI art is, is sometimes the people who adopt this stuff earliest, it becomes worth the most. Like, I don't know if I can flesh out this whole argument here, but maybe the reason the Beatles or Jimi Hendrix are so popular is because they were the first. And maybe Mozart and, you know, is the best because he was the most popular at the time when that became a thing, you know, the compositions and the orchestras and the symphonies and all that. Is there a chance that somebody's going to come out of this quickly? Maybe it's Pratik. That'd be awesome if it was. Somebody's going to come out and say, this is the first AI art. Kind of like the NFTs. The NFTs look so stupid and bad. They're like pixelated apes. <laughs> Maybe the apes have better quality, but what's the one that's like really bad? Like the pe rare Pepe's? It's so dumb. It looks so bad, but because it fell in a history of time when it was the first and it sold for the most, but it could be it could be worth If Pratik wrote the software that creates the art, then yes, wow, how impressive. If Critique is one of a million people, just like you or me, who got an account and just puts in keywords, and then the software makes the art. I agree, I agree. But let's say he has the Instagram account and he gets the followers, and this Instagram account from him, because it's early, gets 100,000 followers, and each image is one of a kind, and he starts selling them. Are you allowed to do that? I, like, I don't, I, maybe you are. It's, it's, I think if you bought an account, don't you get some sort of If you pay for license? the account, you get a license. But if you do not pay for the account, you get like a common Creative Commons license. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if you can make a bunch of art, then get the account, and it works retroactively. <laughs> okay. I don't know how they even know. Yeah. I was reading from the Copyright Office, and this might be a year or two back, so I don't know what the exact law is now, but it seems like the Copyright Office in the United States does not grant true copyright registration for any art that is not created by a human. So mm -hmm. it puts this whole idea of copyright, regardless of what Midjourney says, it's totally in question because maybe the copyright artist is like, no human really made that. Hmm. And I don't know what happened. Remember the stories of like the monkeys taking the guy's camera and taking pictures? Yep. The monkey was the one who owned the copyright because he hit the shutter. It's a very gray area. Right. But again, going back to my point, is just if somebody could become the most famous, most publicized, most marketable person to do this AI art right off the get, the get go, and they start selling images, and all of a sudden it's like the NFT garbage. Man, this is sold for a thousand dollars, and now it's worth two hundred thousand dollars. I gotta get in. I gotta get in. I gotta get in. I gotta. Have you seen the stock that's gone up like three thousand percent? And it's like worth. It's like the fifth. It's like the top 20 most valuable companies in the world, and it's just happened like the last three and weeks. And what is it? Is it some it's crypto thing? Billions of dollars. Yeah, it's, it's, they don't even make anything. <laughs> of course. So this is all marketing, but I believe that AI could be that. All it takes is for celebrities to be like, do you own the Lee Morris art that he's making through Midjourney? Yes, I can make the same thing, but because he did it, it's worth more. I get it. I, think I mean, totally dude, if out. you can drizzle paint on a canvas and it's worth millions of dollars, uh, mid journey's not much different than that. All right, next up. All right, this is the last one, and so this is the winner of the random tutorial. Go to fstoppers.com slash store to see all of the tutorials that we have created with different photographers, and email Lee Morris specifically. Send you me can... a private message on fstoppers. So... I think we've all seen images like this. Is this a series? Do we have multiple images? Yeah, so just, we have this one. Okay. And then we have this one. Oh, I'm sorry. There is one more. Oh, you didn't win. Should we just let this be the winner? Since I thought it was random? You know what? Let's be generous. They're both two? winners. Okay, well, we gave away three this time. Yeah. So we've clearly seen this series before. Sure. This isn't a new idea. Right. But it doesn't mean that it's not still worth pursuing. It's pretty interesting. I kind of wish I could find old pictures of myself. And I mean, I was just in my home in Alaska, like two or three years, three or four years ago. I wonder if it's 
if you're capable of of kind of faking this, right? Where instead of having to find these old photos and then go back to these locations, could you go to locations that you knew were going to change in the near future? Maybe due to uh, you do. development or development, or it's going to be a new season change or something. You take a picture of a little kid in there, you do it with film, or you do it with digital and you make it look like film. You print it out. And so you're you're creating these it images. It could happen in the span of like two years. Yeah. But you're doing it at a higher production value. Like, because this doesn't look very good. And the next one looks even worse. I see what you're saying. I had a similar idea that I wanted to do in Charleston because when we bought our homes in Charleston like 12, 13 years ago, I can't believe it's already been that long. Maybe it's 10 years. There were areas of town that were not developed and all of a sudden stuff started developing really, really fast. And I was thinking, could I do a Mike Kelly style image of the final building that will be there, but before that's built, take a picture of the lot or the crappy building that was there before. And in the span of 10 years, you could have these crazy before and afters of, you know, development. It's probably not a unique idea, but it would be very easy to do. Go around town and just take a bunch of snapshots of the befores. And then when you realize they're building, you have a couple of years before you have to go back and revisit it and take the final images. And it seems like if you approached them and said, hey, I'll license you this photo, it's not like they could say, well, we're just going to hire another photographer for cheaper. No, you are the only one that was there before to get the empty lot that actually looks good. And I think what you're saying is take it a step further. Like in in Charleston, it's really big. Like the con, the Confederacy and the world, you know, the Civil War started there. There's all this early American history that's based out of Charleston and many other colonial cities in America. You could get like a character to dress up as a soldier or slavery or like all of these ideas, right? And put them in the empty lot. Or maybe it's from the 50s. Like maybe there's an old uh, gas station and you get the car and you do something to make it feel like it's older, knowing they're going to plow this down and then build some super modern structure. And now you have an image like this that instead of it being you, it is something that feels of more historic value. And then you have the new sprawling city that's built around it. And it's, how did you get that? But you were smart enough to to tackle something that was pre-developed. Let's rate it. Three, two, one. Two stars. I don't feel like this is really cutting it for me. Like, we've already seen this done, and it's been done at a higher level. If whoever did this is a professional photographer, or, you know, a serious amateur or whatever, I just think you have the opportunity to continue this but do it at, like, a really polished level. And people, people will be blown away by this. If this was done really well... I think it would be super cool. But you're saying really well, not your own photos of your child. I know, whatever. I don't care if it's your own child or whatever. It's just like this location looks like trash. The sky is blown out. The ground looks dirty and ugly. The There's a big white sign that's blurry in the picture. It just looks bad. Yeah, there's like a highlight on the thumb. It's like the, the yeah. aviator glasses are reflecting down. Right. And then this one's so hard to read from the old image. Right. All right, next up. I think that's, oh, we have one more. Before I forget, I think on CNN's website, they just had an article. It was, uh, and maybe we've published on F-Stoppers too. I don't know where all it's been, but it was photographer shoots male model and then photographs them again like 20 years later in the exact same way. So it's kind of this sort of vibe okay. of time. Yeah. And uh, it was interesting. You know, you see like the guy, like imagine Peter Hurley is like, young and scrappy and like you know he's he's like 18 and you're like all right he looks like a good attractive guy and then 20 years later now he's got the stubble and he they say men age better as they get older and all of a sudden now it's like he's actually focused on his physique a little bit more and he's got the scars and the tattoos but he still looks like a fashion model Mm. and he's shot in the exact same place with the exact same you know yeah calvin klein shirtless type of vibe it's an interesting idea, you know. For sure. Or you've seen the one where the the photographer, super famous photographer, shoots the four or five sisters for thirty years hmm. and just captures, and they're all in the exact same look. It's been done many times, but if you can do that religiously every year, after so many years, it starts to become a thing. Yeah. Where you can't easily do that. I had a family portrait client that I did that. I photographed them at one point, and then I photographed them for like eight years straight. 
it was like, I'm not even doing family portraits, but they would contact me, and I don't want to break the five-year streak. Yeah. And so I have it to where, like, new babies are coming in, and now they're grown. It's, it's crazy to go back and look at it. Mm. And then, of course, I broke it a few years ago, but... What um, an asshole. Yeah, I'm sorry. All right, this is the final image. Set of images. Is this this? No, different girls, right? Looks like different girls. I think the idea here, and I don't know that I like the idea, but the idea was to use the same prop with multiple people in different locations to kind of give it a vibe of this is something I can offer in my photography. Is that what he explains? This was taken by Rayanne Hemed. Ordered this ladder slash seat thing from Ikea for 30 bucks and have been carrying it around for some time in my studio. I asked models to bring along Blaine t-shirts, maybe he means bland t-shirts, and their favorite pair of jeans to sustain a minimalistic setup. My aim was to get some consistency going in my portfolio and attempt to develop a style to get to be known locally for. I like the thought process behind the idea. I just don't know that this ladder is the prop to do it with. Hmm. And I definitely prefer the two images on the right. I agree, too. I don't too. like the fake brick or real brick the, Yeah, the, the brick looks particularly fake. And I'm trying to figure out why. Why does it look so fake? Is it because the lighting on it is so uniform? Is it because of the edge of the ground and the brick? Does that make it look fake? I don't know, but it doesn't feel real to me. I came so close in our house in Charleston, our studio in Charleston, of doing some kind of brick, and it was not going to be red. I wanted to do something more of a light gray. And I think I'm okay and glad I didn't do it. I mean, it was going to be expensive to do it. And it would be real brick. But I think brick sometimes just translates in a scene really weird. It, it looks fake, even mm. if it's real. And then I was going down the road of should I buy get an artist to do stucco and multiple layers and, and make it look like this has been broken and exposed through many different structures, make it look old. And I was like, that's going to take so much time and energy, and it still might not look the way that it is in my head. Well, what do you, you, what do you think this? of the idea? Because I think this is very popular with, like, photo booths. People might have a couch or have a setup that they do over and over again. Okay. And then all of a sudden you're kind of known as the person. I just did the uh, the light mods. They make your strobes look like studio lights. It's going to be something that you do over and over and over again, but it's an aesthetic look that you would become known for. Do you like that idea? Sure. I, but like you said, if I did not read this, never in a million years would I have even noticed. Right the seat so it needs to be something bigger and more extravagant than just an ikea chair and something i just noticed now which is a little weird the worst part about this chair is in the first image that little hinge yeah. but the hinge doesn't exist in the second image so do you just pull that off it's my eye goes right to that hinge in the first image and it's like oh it's not open all the way she's in danger and then and then i think oh the Background is weird and fake. Why did they do that? And uh, her pose looks awkward and her face looks uncomfortable. But then when I look at the other two girls in the middle and the right, it looks great to me. It's kind of like a Gap ad or something. I was just at Ikea. and I feel like every time I go to a store like that, I'm constantly thinking, is there a piece of furniture that's cheap that I could buy and put in the studio? And maybe it would only be used for one shoot. But I didn't see anything in there that really had the character or texture that I really liked. Ikea is weird, man. I, I feel like they have the potential to make really cool, cheap furniture, but most of their furniture, in my opinion, is so freaking ugly. It's yeah. And it's almost like miniature in size. A lot of their chairs and stuff, maybe they fit you perfect, but for normal size adults, they're way too small. But then, like, we did an Ikea kitchen in this house when we renovated it, and I feel like it looks great. Like yeah. it's, it's just normal looking. It doesn't... But something about their furniture. Their couches look bad, their desks and their beds. Like, everything is strange. Yeah. But then they'll have other things. Like, they're all built. Like, you build everything at Ikea, but they're built really well. If you buy stuff off Amazon that's 
you know, you have to assemble. You could just tell this is going to break or it's going to, it's not designed well. Mm. And then you get Ikea furniture and everything is built together to where it's like the most sturdy you could make it with those parts. But if a third party tries to copy it, it always feels cheaper and worse. Hmm. But the design itself isn't great. Yeah, they need to team up with the people that work for Target. You know how Target kind of took Walmart's idea but then actually put yeah. decent-looking stuff in their store? Or Restoration Hardware. Could you imagine? Well, <laughs> sure, but that's like the opposite. Ikea and Restoration Hardware are like I, but they the don't farthest have, possible. I feel like furniture is the biggest scam. It just seems like if you, because I don't know, is Restoration Hardware's wood, is it actually really good wood? I, uh, or is it processed in a way, the same with West Elm. I like a store called uh, World Market. All their stuff, it feels like it's a laminate or something that it's still heavy and it's not going to break like particle board. But it feels processed to me. Yeah, it's not, it's not solid wood. But then they charge you, you know, tens of thousands of dollars well these these right here i don't know it's probably hard for you guys to see in the background here let me close this i have these little two blue you know side table things back here with the gold i think these were like i think i saved something like 85 percent on these Mm -hmm. and so they might have been you know $2,000 $2,000 each normally, and then I got them for 85% off or whatever. And I was just thinking to myself, how much does this actually cost to make this? You know, yeah. if they can sell them for 85% off. Because that's probably a veneer, right? Right. Like wood I, grain I isn't I real. I think or, it's real. Or like this piece here, I don't know if you can see this. This cabinet looks really cool, but maybe that metal is not hard to make at all. I mean, Ikea's got some stuff that kind of looks like that. Yeah. I don't know. Furniture is one of those things where when it's super, super cheap, you can tell or you know it's cheap because you built it and you're like this is cheap but then once it's built and it goes against the wall if it's designed well and it's cheap you still might look at it and say man that looks really cool but it sits with you knowing that was a $50 cabinet (laughs) I don't know it's a weird thing but this definitely translates in photography that does look like a cheap chair but I don't think I would have even really cared about it it's not about the chair for me it could have been a stool or an apple box or a piece of wood. I don't care. It's it's all about the girls for me. And I feel like the middle and the right one look good. The one on the left, not so much. Let's rate it. Three, two, one. I'm going three stars. I feel like the two of these images are fine. They probably could... Like, the one on the right, I really like. I mean, the bra strap, fall, the shirt strap falling off kind of makes it feel a little more sexual than it should. But it feels like a high-end catalog type of image. Yeah. I just don't know. I'm giving it a two based on the idea of this is a theme or a personal project that you're working on. That seems kind of lame to me. From a photographic standpoint, the middle and the right image probably are solid threes. They go in your portfolio for this kind of work. Don't like the image on the left. Anything else you have to say about it? Are we all done? Um, no, they think your guitar looks like a teeny, teeny guitar. Well, so the weird thing about this room and what you can't tell on this um, so camera position is that that guitar back there is in like another cubby in like, this room. Like a cove it something. looks like the wall that's right behind this black piece of furniture here is, the, is the same wall that goes behind the guitar, but it's not. That guitar is way further away than this. And so I did all these things, moving the camera back and forth. Like, I don't even, I think maybe the corner of the wall is being hid by the uh, the black here. Mm. So you can't tell, and it, it does look like a crazy optical illusion. I don't love it. It also, this doesn't look very good with two of us because it's like I'm in this black area here. Your head is kind of in this lamp. Yeah. But when it's me by myself and I'm right here, it looks pretty good, and that's why I designed it this way. But, yeah, it's a little weird. All right. Well, we have some AI to look at next week. Yeah, if you if you haven't done the AI stuff yet, may I suggest checking out Mid Journey. There's a few other ones that I've put. I didn't link to them. If you go to the contest page, 
But there's a few other ones where you can just type the prompt directly into a browser. Oh, okay. And they so look it's easier. I feel like they look a lot worse, but some of them give you more options on which direction you want to go. Do you want to make it look like a watercolor or do you want it to look like a sinister, mm. you know, painting? Or do you want it to look like uh, neon colored lights? Like it kind of lets you push it in a certain direction where mid journey is really bad about that. Mid journey, you don't know what direction it's going to go. But you can use those keywords. Like I would type in painting or watercolor and it would make it look like yeah, that. Yeah. Um, so if you haven't done it before, give it a try. I think it'll really impress you. It's so easy to do and then the results are so good. Um, it's much easier than having to go out and take some photo for a contest. So make some artificial intelligence art, upload it to fstoppers.com slash contests. You will see this contest. Um, I'm excited to do this one next week. And uh, we'll, we'll be more on the ball about keeping up with this and doing this. Oh, and I wanted to say this too. I am very close uh, with finishing my book that I've been writing for years because I'm incredibly lazy. My book is my book is like a it's kind of like a self-help type inspirational, you know, get up off your ass and like do stuff and some interesting stories and stuff like that. If anybody watching this is into that genre of book, I'm looking for some people to read it and give me some honest critiques. I've gotten an honest critique from Pi who told me to rewrite the entire book. And uh, that was like a year ago that he told me to rewrite the, maybe it was longer. And I have not opened the book since then because I was like so discouraged that he told mm. me to rewrite it. Yeah. Um, so if anybody is interested, send me a private message on F Stoppers and uh, I'll send you a copy. And I, I just want to get some other people's opinions. Have you had other authors or writers read your book? People who have published or self-published? I have not. That would probably be the best because- Maybe. Okay, so I had I had uh, Alex Cook, one of our writers, read it. How many pages is this? I have no idea. I mean, like, do you have a guess? Is it like 50, 80, 200? I don't know. I mean, I don't even know what a page is because is a books seller. are in different sizes. <laughs> Got to get this book. Uh, I, I mean, you know, I think maybe word count would be a more accurate thing, okay. and I could look that up. But um, I, I just went through the entire book in two days. So... I don't know if that, you know, like maybe it took like five or six hours to read the whole book. Dude, I think I'm the slowest reader ever. Like, I don't understand. Well, I, so I have an app on my computer that reads for me. Yeah. And so that's how, like, when I want to get through a lot of text, I'll turn this app on and it'll read the web page. So that's how I read my book in the last but two see, days. But see, I buy audio books and I'll buy a book and it'll be 10 hours 15 hours, I mean, some of them, like 10 hours read by the author. That's the best is when you get the author to read their own book. Yeah. And you will, I'll listen to it at 1.5 or something, and I'm thinking, this took me three days to listen to. But if I were to read it, it would have to take me, and I, I'm like listening to it all the time at the gym while driving. <laughs> like, it's not, oh, I just listened to it for an yeah, hour. Yeah, I mean, yeah, 10 yeah. hours to get through having the author read it at 1.5 speed. I'm just thinking, how do people sit down and you read the reviews and they're like, I sat down one night and I read the whole book. And I'm thinking, how can people read that fast? And yeah. are they taking it all in? There's different levels of reading. I'll, I'll read a whole page and then just realize that, man, I didn't comprehend a single, like yeah, I'm yeah. on autopilot here and then I got to restart. That's why I use the app to read because I'm not too smart. Um, but anyway, I want to get this damn book out and done. Like even if it's horrible. Just to say you did it. Just to finish it and be done with it. Like my, the whole, the thesis of the book is to like come up with a plan and finish it and it's going to suck you're not going to be good the first time that's the whole point in learning and getting good at things and then do it again and again and again and again and again yeah. or learn that you don't want to do that but you want to do this or somebody sees whatever you did and it was bad and they say hey I'm now interested in you because of that. Blah. Yeah. And you you round the corner and you do something else. And so I'm not even taking my own advice by continuing to procrastinate with this stupid book. I did all the hard work years ago, but I've just been like embarrassed or like discouraged to rewrite it like Pi said. The 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 main critique that I've gotten from Pi and Alex is that Lee, this book isn't about you at all. And I'm like, I no, I don't like, I, although I tell a few stories about, like, some things that have happened in my life and mostly friends and colleagues and stuff, 
I don't want it to be about me because I don't feel like my life is that interesting. And they're like, no, your life is that interesting. You need to rewrite this and it needs to be like a chronological story of your life with lessons you've learned along the way. And I'm like, I don't know. I just feel like for most of my life, I've been kind of like lazy, boring person that doesn't do very much. That doesn't sound like a good book to me. I've read other really good inspirational books and they're not like stories about the authors. Well, I keep thinking uh, the Dale Carnegie book that everyone reads. Yeah, that's one of my favorite is, books. Um, and I've only read it once, I think. It's about him and meeting people, but what I remember from the book, I mean, it's been like 10, 15 years since I've read it. Isn't it just him saying like, I met this lawyer and let me tell you the, the e- lesson he exactly. taught me? Yes, yeah, and that that is the book that I literally brought up and I was like, I'm not saying that my book can ever be as good as How to Win Friends and Influence People, but that is probably the book that's so simple to read and it just hits home. Like you could pick it up and read it for one minute or read it for 10 minutes or read the whole book. And it's like, it's just easy reading that anyone can understand. And that's what I want my book to be but you about. Need to, you need to write like The Dirt or The Pickup Artist or, you know, one of those See, I just books where yes. you're, you're, you're locked in a... You're locked in a shower in Iceland with Elia Lacardi. Exactly. And the water's spraying everywhere, and it's super <laughs> exciting. And the lesson that I learned from this excursion to Iceland was, and uh, you know, and you got to have some hookers and drugs involved. But That's the thing. I think that if I was a more exciting person or a more degenerate person, and I had all the hooker stories, then sure, I should write a book like that. I haven't done any of that. Well, that's your, I don't know that's if you know this, book. but I've never once hired a hooker, Patrick. No? Not once. Well, maybe you need to write your next book, and it's going to be like, I had never done any of this, and I turned 40. <laughs> and then I decided to write this book. I was going to have to take LSD and hire hookers and yeah. uh, you know, potentially murder somebody that no one will ever know about in another third world country. And here's how that whole experience played out. I agree. That could be another book. I just don't think it is this book, but it also sucks to like send it to people who I respect their writing, <laughs> and then they're like, this is not good. This comment's too good. Uh, you, you need to title it, how, how to Lose Friends and Alienate People. There you go. That's a good one. <laughs> it's not a bad idea. Well, I don't think you would do any of those things. I, I think, you know, I haven't read your book, but, you know, from what you've described it as and hearing Pi talk about it, it's probably still valuable to a lot of people. People would read it, but maybe you're not hitting all the check boxes for like the mass public that See, I pick think up I am. I think I've written it in such a way that anyone could like I don't want people to read it because they know who Lee Morris is on F Stoppers or YouTube because everything that I've created for F Stoppers or YouTube for the most part, not my vacuum review but for the most part is photography and videography related, right? Yeah. And although I mention a few things in the book about that, 99.9% of the book has nothing to do with being a photographer or a videographer. That's not the goal but of the book. But it's not even through the lens of that, right? No. There's no stories about like, I went to Cambodia for this photo project and what I learned no. there was from the people. No. I had this revelation that- No. No, but see, that was what could be kind of interesting. That's what, that, well, that's what Pi and Alex like, say. Like, you've done all these incredible things. That's what they say, but I just feel like it's not that incredible. It's not that. Anyone can get a flight and go to Southeast Asia or, you know, everyone's been to Iceland. And... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and, what, and yes, I could, like, do these little humble brag stories about doing the stuff that I've done, but they don't really... They that's, don't really fit in with any of the stuff that I'm talking about in the book. That's the hard part is you don't want it to sound like bragging. Um, I just recently read Dave Grohl's book or listened to his book. And it was it was kind of like that too. Like when I got to the end of it, I was like, I really enjoyed this book. But then I started reading reviews and people were like, he would just leave this crazy story kind of open-ended. And mm. I was like, he did. And none of it, he talks about Nirvana for such a small period of time. And you're like, I want to know... What happened with Kurt Cobain? Like, what was it like to lose your band? Like, all of these crazy things. And, like, he just never touches that. And I can understand that topic not being touched. But there's all these other stories where it's entertaining. And I feel like I was being entertained listening to him tell these stories. But when I really stepped back, it was kind of like Seinfeld, a bunch of entertainment for nothing. Like, it had no purpose. It didn't feel like an actual biography. Okay. See? And your your book could kind of have that, too, where... 
it doesn't have any a of hint of who you are. N like, uh, no, almost no hint. Do you talk about like weddings and like wedding stories or no. things you experience no. with? And that, that's the thing. And like your attitude right now worries me as well. Like, oh shit! Like I've really, I've really gone in the wrong direction. It with this sounds book. like you're just appealing to people who literally have no idea who you are or care to know who you are. Whereas we all know you, and we're thinking your book needs to be about the craziest things you've seen at weddings and how you learned to start several businesses and like you. But yeah, it's not. It doesn't necessarily need to be like that. But you probably will start a second book if you. No, pass. hell no! <laughs> I don't. I don't ever. I don't ever want. What do if? This. What if finishing this book? This book is all about not procrastinating, and you finally publish it, and it does become a semi hit in some way, mm -hmm. and the reaction that you get back, I don't know if it's financial or just from people telling you, mm -hmm. you say, "Man, this is what I need to do. Like the next, I need to write another book. I can do it so much better, and I enjoy the outcome of the first one." But okay. you, haven't, you haven't crossed that path yet. Right. Just like in your book, you probably say people who have never started that first business, they don't know if they want to start businesses or not. Well, yeah. Um, and I have so many little, like, stories and quips and stuff about things like this. Uh, for example, and I didn't bring this up in the book, but, you know, when we did the tutorial with Peter Hurley, the first tutorial we ever yeah, did, yeah. and it was an absolute nightmare, and we hated every second of it, and then we realized we filmed it all wrong, and we were editing it, and then we had to go back and film it again, and then we showed it to all our friends, and they said, this sucks, you can't even release it. It's gonna, you know, this is going to be bad for your brand if you release it. And then we did release it, and it made over a million dollars, and we were like, what the hell? Like, we almost did not even release something. We had done all the work already. Yeah. We didn't almost release it, and then it made over a million dollars. And you're like, how in the world could we have been that close to giving up on something when all of the work was already done? Is that story? The story's not in the book? No, I didn't. That's like one of the maybe, craziest maybe, maybe stories. I should, maybe I should put that one in the book. That's, that's a good one that should go in the book. Yeah, or I'm thinking about, you know, I never really learned to kiteboard. I did a whole summer of getting so, so very close. And then I have missed out on perhaps like the most <laughs> exciting thing I could have ever done in my life. So and I, I, I yeah. am I in the book about kiteboarding? Not specifically. I do oh talk about kiteboarding. Oh I do talk about kiteboarding, and I talk about how, you know, it's a huge learning curve, and it's going to huge learning curve, and and with everything in life, but it's very easy to see with the sport. Like you have to fail. Like with uh, I've always given you crap about your um, wakeboarding. Wakeboarding, and I'm like. To get decent at wakeboarding, let's say you have to fall 1,000 times, yeah. right? You have gotten so good at not falling <laughs> that you reached your peak wakeboarding skills at like the fifth time you ever yeah. wakeboarded. And you never push the envelope. Yeah, you never I, tried to jump. You I never, never get airborne. Anything. I never like go face first and have the awful. Nothing ever outs. happens. You just get tired and you let go. Yeah. That's like the pinnacle of your wakeboard. But I get what I want out of it. I'm like going 20 miles an hour <laughs> behind a boat, crossing the wake. Like I feel like, all right, that's enough thrill to me. I don't Maybe. need to be airborne. Maybe. I'd like to be in my mind, but yeah. I also just don't push the envelope for that. Yeah, I think I think a lot of people, they. The, the example I used was with kiteboarding. It's like the beginning of kiteboarding specifically sucks really bad. You experienced that part. You even got to like the top of the mountain of like you could do it. You yeah, could kiteboard. I rode for 30 seconds yeah, and you, I had to turn and I lost the board. You know, like you had like a small taste of fun. And I did it in Turks and Caicos where like that's the dream. Right. You're riding on vacation in a, one of the most beautiful places in the world. But then you ended up quitting because like it is so tiring you're it feels like you're drowning you lost your kite it was expensive you lost the at board. the time yeah it's so like, expensive all of these reasons made you quit but you quit before the enjoyment even began yeah and i feel like that's what so many people do in all aspects of their life including me and maybe this book is an example of that where it's like i've done the hard work but now i'm too afraid to show it or i'm too afraid to actually publish it or whatever it might be. And the like truth right on the other side of this hill that you've climbed is all the people saying this is the greatest book for <laughs> of all time for this generation to get off, you know. And but the real thing that will probably happen is that no one will read it and it will just like sizzle, you know, fade out. Yeah. And and, and I'll be like, damn it, I cannot believe I spent 
years on something that nobody even cared to look at. Like, and that's but this, living in this community, there's there's this mentality of if you can get it published and just get it online forever, you're going to be a published author. Right, right. And you could go to Amazon and find, I mean, your dad has this. You can go search your dad and he's got two or three books that are on it. Like, that's pretty badass. Right. Mike Kelly has it. I don't know if you can buy Mike's books anymore, but he's got like three books he's published. Like, that's yeah. pretty awesome. Yeah, I agree. I agree. His but, books are way cooler than mine. Like but. somebody is saying in the chat here that they've, you know, they've been to Southeast Asia and been on TV for all these hours. Like you can do these accomplishments, and from your perspective and your lens, it starts to feel like nothing. You could look at our YouTube views and, and be like, so what? We have two hundred million, whatever it is, and like to us that means nothing. But if you're on the other side of that, you feel like, how could I possibly start a channel? Right. How could I possibly get subscribers, get viewers? How could I possibly learn? To, people say this all the time. You. I was shooting in San Juan, and somebody who knew us came up and was like, you are so good on camera. And I'm like, I am horrible on camera. <laughs> I've just learned to do it, and then I've learned to edit to make it look good. Yeah. And uh, it's, a, it's a learned skill, but when you haven't experienced those things, it's same idea of living in your town and not doing all the awesome stuff that you – we've talked about this before. If you live in New York City and you've never gone to all the tourist attractions – like you're missing out because you just didn't take the time to do something that's right in front of you. I think there's some parallel. Maybe that's like a tangent, but um. yeah, I just got to get it done. I don't even I don't even care anymore. It's like I I've, I put it off for so freaking long. Even if I just released it and people gave it bad reviews and were like, "This is not even worth reading." At least it's behind me. You yeah. know what I mean? I can just be like, okay. Because I feel Been bad about that. having the, uh, the the personal project with the ant builders. It's just sitting there. This is the yeah. first time I've shown really any of the pictures. And it comes back in my mind, and I think, why did I spend that money and, like, do that? I've already gone a third of the way in. Like, I've done a significant amount of the work. Why don't I do it? This is so much bigger. I mean, you've written pages and pages of this book and proofed it and organized it and brainstormed it and come up with stories and tweaked them and gotten them as tight as you can. I know, and Pi says it needs to all be rewritten. <laughs> but people said that about Peter Hurley. They were like, this is the worst tutorial ever, and now we'll meet people who say, Peter Hurley's first tutorial changed my life. I know. It changed Peter's life. That's it changed true. our lives. It changed thousands of people's lives, which is crazy to think about, but we were told by so many people that this is unpublishable, and you can't charge for this either. <laughs> and then now you're on the other side of the, you know, the mountain, and you're like, that was a good decision over there. It helped a lot of people, and it helped Peter become a teacher. Like he wasn't—he didn't even want people to know what he was doing. Now look at him, telling everybody all his secrets. He's shebanging everybody. Yeah. So it's—I don't know. You just got to, just got to do. But I think that's what the book's about. What's the title? Do you have a title for the book? I think the title is going to be "Do Something." Yeah. I think that's the title. Um, have I, you uh, gotten to where you're drafting up the concept, like? Is this an ebook? You'll actually make the book. I want to actually make the book. I don't know if anybody's going to buy it, but I'm going to do the, like, I'm going to have to try to do the audio recording and everything. And, like, as you guys can tell, I can hardly read. <laughs> so that's going to be miserable. But I think I just have to do it just to, like, get the job done. I wonder how difficult that is because every now and then you'll see bloopers of YouTubers or actors, you know, and you see how many times they've done this and they're getting mad. I'm trying to think, I just saw one recently. I don't know if it was like Carl Taylor, somebody that we know, and it was just, oh, it's good to see they do that because I do that every day where you're just the fifth time going through it and the model's standing next to you like, are you gonna get this line, you know? <laughs> but reading it, it's the same thing. You ever listen to an audiobook and you can tell where there's been like a cut or the break for the day, they come back and they sound a little raspier <laughs> right, or they right. sound better. Yeah, it's going to suck. And then to do it without any visual, it's literally just an audio file, and you have to then go back and make sure that what is being said is what's there. Like, it seems more tedious than editing an hour-long video of you actually teaching something on. It's going to be horrible. But I do want to create a um, – And what, what the hell are we talking about? I don't know. Here? People were like, this is way more exciting than the <laughs> critique. <laughs> it's, it's funny. It's like the group of people that like to just hear us talk – are true fans and we appreciate you but the majority of people do not like just hearing us talk but anyway well, that's why we 
pat it at the beginning with. Hey, that's right. Um, Pi Jerza is doing all this crazy stuff with relationships now, and I don't know if you guys know. Like he's he's a close friend of ours. He owns SLR Lounge. Um, he's one of the most successful wedding photographers on the planet, but. He has written this book on relationships. Um, I won't say the name because it's I don't, right there. It's, do you have it? I know the name. Oh, you know the name. I just don't know that. Like, it's not published oh, yet. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. He's rewritten this book like six times. He's waiting to, to publish it. But if you guys have seen him on social media, he's doing all this content on relationships now. TikTok and yeah, he's gotten crazy followers on TikTok and Instagram. It has nothing to do with SLR Lounge, nothing to do with relation, uh, nothing to do with photography. And uh, he's also teamed up with this doctor, and they're doing like live coaching with married couples. Yeah, it's wild to yeah. see this grow, and it's grown into this huge thing. Like they have tons of customers. It's like a six-figure business already, and the and book's not even, even out. He hasn't even made the book. But he told me something really interesting. Um, he's been struggling with the publisher because if anybody's familiar with the book industry, you just get raped by the publisher. They, they take like 88% and you get 12%, right? But we have a little bit of an advantage because we have a following already. We have money. So like we don't need an, an advance. advance. We don't need them to pay for printing costs. Like we can pay for it. Um, but you just can't get a better deal than 12%. That's like the standard. Well, Pi had this uh, wedding client who was a lawyer who wrote this book on compliance, like some boring book that nobody would ever want, except other lawyers, right? Yeah. And she started to learn that there's a difference between publishers and distributors. And all people who write books were, were trying to find a publisher because we want to get into Barnes and Noble and yeah. whatever. But that is not their job. That is the distributor's job. So then you think, okay, well, I'm just going to go straight to the distributor. But you can't communicate with a distributor unless you are a publisher. It's like there's this hierarchy set. This gatekeeping? Yes. But do you have to be a successful publisher? No. Okay, I see where this is going. Yes. So this lawyer learns about this and she just does the paperwork and becomes a publisher yeah. for herself. Yeah. And she she now says her book is in every bookstore. She's like it's in every Walmart. It's yeah. on compliance law. Yeah. Like it doesn't even like nobody at and, Walmart. And Walmart's got like 1% of the books that oh, Barnes and Noble probably has. Probably way less than yeah, that. It's, it's like, like one miles. Yeah. yeah. So, she's like how about you give me a cut of your business and I'm going to turn you into your own publisher? So I think she started that process. Like, Pi is going to be his own publisher. So I'm like, Pi, will you publish my book? And I think he said, yeah. So mm -hmm. that might be And an then that's how you become a publisher and now <laughs> want the cuts that everybody, you know. Hey, I'd, I'd rather give him 88% than some, somebody else. I'm pretty else, sure you, you know? can get a better deal than that. From yeah, you better. You better. Well, and then are you doing... Um, like there's a whole game of like getting it to be the best seller and pre-order and all this stuff. I like, just don't feel like it's that good of a book. You know, like But there's probably been a lot of horrible best books. I know, books. that's a thing. So But if you can do that with the first book you ever published, then you've got it made. I know. You've given yourself the title. You're the Oscar winning artist now forever, and you just played the game of So it is possible to buy your way into the New York uh, Times bestseller list. You can do it by basically just buying. I at least I heard a few years ago the number was around two hundred fifty thousand dollars of your own book. So you just go to all the websites and you just buy thousands of copies from Walmart and Barnes and Noble and Books a Million and Amazon and you buy them and they all come to your house and you don't know what the hell to do with them, but you have now made it to the New York Times bestseller list. And uh, there's also some other games that you can play to do it that aren't quite that sleazy, but... Then there's something where you just wait. Can't you do pre-orders and all of those pre-orders count for the first week of sales? Yes. So if you just did a pre-order for a year and just built this thing up, yes. you could potentially be like, today's the release date and I'm already halfway there. Yes. Yeah, you can, you can do that. Why has Ryan not done this? 
Is there not a way for David and Ryan to get her book on a bestseller? She hasn't reached that milestone yet, right? I don't think she, I don't know if she has or not for young adult novels or whatever. I think I think the issue is is that our friend Ryan does young adult novels, but I don't know how much of a following she personally has. I don't know how many little girls out there are waiting for her next book to come out. Maybe their parents are, though. It's like video games or something. You remember going to the store and putting in the pre-order for Mortal Kombat 2 or something? But that's Mortal Kombat 2. That's like everyone who's ever played sure. video games knows Mortal Kombat 2 is coming. But all you're trying to do is win for this specific thing, and I would imagine young adult fantasy. I don't know what the genre is, but that would probably be proportionately sized to her following if it's not a big following, right? Yeah. I... Like, is there a bestsellers list for, like, photography I don't know. Techniques? <laughs> and if there is, I can see where these, you know, well-known photographers get that, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who knows? All right. We've talked far too long. I think I'm going to take a nap. All right. Then... So they need to contact you and get your book. Just, like, three people. I mean, hopefully not that many people see this. I don't want to send it to, like, a thousand people. Uh, but yeah, I just want to send it to a few strangers around the world who like this genre of book. Self-help, motivation. Yeah, you know, you, you want to start your own business, but you can't get up off the couch. You've, you've started something, but you don't know how to promote it. Like, just kind of stuff like that. Cool. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. fstoppers.com slash contest for the AI critique. fstoppers.com slash store. To help Lee publish this book. Yeah, that's true. I'm going to need a quarter of a million dollars to get on the New York Times bestseller list. See you guys. That was 120.